Welcome to the Moss Adams webcast, Guard Your Investment in Valuable Contracts. Before we get started, we have a brief video that will answer questions for you and improve your participation. Moss Adams is pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize both how you view our presentation and how you interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. For example, you can click the file folder icon to download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by clicking Q&A in the bottom left-hand portion of the icon bar and typing in your question. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. We'll ask polling questions throughout today's presentation. Per the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy Webcast CPE Standards, CPE credit will be awarded based on your participation in these polls. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. If you're attending this webcast in a group, in order to receive CPE credit, you must complete our attendance sheet available in the file folder icon at the bottom of your screen. Please have all group members sign the sheet and please remit only one sheet per group. Also note, today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and is not available to participants who view the on-demand version. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon to open a PDF file you can save to your computer. We'll email a copy of your PDF certificate in two weeks if you can't download it today. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. I'm so pleased to introduce today's speakers, Mark Steranka and Robert Gutierrez, both veterans of working with contracts. Mark has over 30 years of experience working with businesses, not-for-profit organizations, and governmental entities throughout the United States. His expertise includes strategic planning, succession planning, compensation benchmarking and design, uh, internal and performance audits, management, organization and operations assessments, as well as third-party contract compliance. Mark works with businesses ranging from startups to Fortune 50 companies, not-for-profit organizations of all sizes, and federal, state, and local governments. He helps organizations improve their performance and get to their next level. He is respected by his clients for his ability to listen and understand their needs, to provide sound advice and practical solutions, and make the process a rewarding experience. Joining Mark is Robert Gutierrez. Robert brings over eight years of internal audit experience, where he has in-depth experience performing contract audits and in working with governments at the federal, state, and local levels. Prior to joining Moss Adams, Robert was a senior auditor with the Defense Contract Audit Agency. This means Robert is able to provide his clients with contract agency insights without penalties for oversights. Robert also has 15 years of experience as a tax attorney where he specialized in advising owners of all types of businesses concerning the preparation and negotiation of general business contracts, entity structure, and issues related to corporate governance. Thank you both for joining us today. Mark, I will now turn the presentation over to you. Great. Thanks, Tanya, and good morning or afternoon depending on your time zone. I know we've got a, a great blend of organizations represented on this call and webinar, so, so thanks all for joining us. And uh, on that note, let's, let's start with just getting a, a little bit better understanding for, for all of us of, of the mix of, of organizations represented on the call. So in our first polling question, if you wouldn't mind selecting the uh, type of organization that you're representing, and then depending on your screen size, you may have to scroll down to hit the submit button. So uh, make the selection of your type of organization, scroll down, hit submit, and then we'll uh, give it a, a few seconds here to get your responses in and then see what the, the mix of uh, organizations looks like. And 
And we'll uh, move ahead here and see. So uh, hopefully you all can see. So uh, less than 5% uh, federal government, our largest group, uh, state and local government at about 36%, travel government, higher ed, not-for-profit. If we scroll down, uh, no research institutions and some contractors and, and others. And I know there are some, some private businesses that I'd call non-contractors also on the webinar. So hopefully we, we, we think we've got something for, for everyone here, but certainly hold us accountable to that. If, if there's something that you need or are hoping to get out of this that we don't address, please submit a question and we'd be more than happy to answer that. So our agenda. So I'm going to talk just briefly about why contract audits, sort of, sort of the bigger picture, and then I'm going to turn it over to Robert for the, for the heart of our, our webinar, which is talking about federal contracts and other government contracts, but that will also be certainly applicable to contracts in the private sector. So why contract audits? Well, really, there are two primary drivers of contract audits. Either you have to do them or you choose to do them or you want to do them. And uh, if, if you have to do them, it's because of a requirement of your funding source, which may or may not be government funding, um, or you're doing work with uh, a government governmental entity or government dollars are involved. And, and typically, those contracts in those first two cases is stipulate that uh, the, either an audit will be required or that the organization has the right to conduct an audit. Sometimes they're specific about what type of audit that might be, sometimes not so much. And then there are other drivers or reasons for, for thinking about uh, auditing contracts. One is just a general reliance, and all organizations rely to some extent, some more than others, on third parties to get done what you need to get done. And, it, and so, Typically, depending on the extent of that, you may want to understand how well is that process working for you and helping you achieve your mission, vision, goals. Um, you may not have the strongest contracts. Lots of contracts don't have um, necessarily strong terms and conditions that protect you, and so instead of proactively managing that through the terms and conditions of the contract, you're doing it more on the back end via a contract audit. Or, like uh, some organizations, and in, in, in lots of cases, organizations don't uh, spend that much time really monitoring and overseeing the contracts. Now, in a construction environment, certainly they typically are. But when we're outsourcing services to third parties, we happen to be a local government, we're contracting with another government, uh, a private business, a not-for-profit, uh, sometimes we just tend to See, if things are happening, all must be good, all must be well, but are we really getting the biggest bang for a buck? Are we really accomplishing to the greatest extent possible what we're trying to do? And then just what sort of goes hand in hand with that is lack of reporting from your service provider about what's being accomplished, perhaps what's not being accomplished, so that we can have an understanding, again, are we maximizing our investment? Are we maximizing our value? So some reasons why... We might have to, or we might think about doing, uh, uh, conducting contract audits. So what's the, what's the larger context for this? Where, where, where do contract audits exist sort of in the, in the bigger scheme of things? And, and really what we're talking about is an internal audit function and things that may happen within internal audit because what are the goals of internal audit? They're to reduce risk for an organization, strengthen controls for an organization, enhance performance for an organization. And of course, all three of those elements uh, pertain to contracts. And so this uh, webinar is actually a first in a series of three webinars that really are focused on helping organizations understand how do we maximize the value of an internal audit function. First, we're covering contracts. Second, in a webinar, we'll be covering construction audits. And then third and finally, in a webinar, we'll be covering internal controls and performance audits to really try to encompass all the different types of activities that can happen within internal audit that, again, to, are, are really should be geared towards helping our organizations achieve our goals and objectives to the greatest extent possible. So in that sort of internal audit uh, broader perspective, so what are sort of areas of focus or, or, again, sort of what are drivers of uh, the need for internal audit services? 
again, of which within the co contract audits are a piece. So decentralized activities. So all organizations perform some amount of uh, work decentrally, so things not under at headquarters, at the home office, under the, the watchful eye of, of executive management, or even within finance department itself. So things like uh, accounts receivable and collections, cash handling, grants management, procurement, all things that tend to have activities centrally and decentrally. And so how do we make sure that those activities are operating across the organization the way that we want them to? Obviously, we're talking today about contracted activities, so our reliance on third parties to help us achieve our goals and objectives. Where there's significant revenues and expenses uh, involved, where there's financial impact to your organization. Where you have external requirements, compliance elements that if not um, adhered to could have a negative impact on your organization. Where your policies and procedures may not be robust and or up to date, which can make you susceptible to inconsistencies in how we perform activities and susceptible to loss of institutional knowledge if people leave and you don't have those policies and procedures in place that guide the next person in line on how to do those. And then for organizations who have them, ethics or fraud hotlines, where those can also be a source of uh, concerns, whether by internal or external stakeholders, of things that um, might uh, warrant focus from a, a general internal audit perspective on uh, how we can help the organization improve. So let's bring it back specifically to contract audits as a subset of internal audit and, and just answer for us on the, the second polling question, sort of what's brought you here today? So besides the, the uh, continuing professional education, the CPE, kind of what's your primary driver for, for thinking about and learning more about contract audits? Are there requirements for your funding, whether um, government or not? Is it because you rely heavily on third parties? We contract requirements, lack of monitoring and oversight, or lack of reporting. So again, what you feel is your primary driver. And again, if you need to, scroll down so that you can hit the submit button after making your selection. And again, we'll give it a, a few seconds here to get your responses in. So let's let's see what we've got. So uh, what do we got? Forty about fifty percent uh, required. Uh, really, no surprise there. Reliance on third parties. We con uh, about six percent, nine percent. We contract requirements. Oops, sorry, skipped ahead instead of scrolling down. Um, lack of monitoring and oversight. Twenty-five percent. Lack of reporting. And, and I'm sure if we said gave you the option of all of the above, that would have probably been the largest. Uh, uh, selection made. So again, I believe we'll do a, a, a pretty thorough job of addressing sort of each of these aspects of contract audits, but again, if we're not hitting, nailing what you're looking for, please submit a question and, and we'll make sure to do that either as we're going or at the tail end of the presentation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robert to really focus this in on uh, the topic of today, which are contract auditing. So Robert, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, I wanted to start out first with federal contracts, regardless of whether you have one or not. Uh, the federal environment has the most rules, regulations, requirements, staff uh, related to managing and auditing contracts. So it's a good place to start and gain an understanding and uh, kind of observe some of the issues and techniques. Now, the, the federal government is one of the largest purchasers in the world of goods, services, uh, the Department of Defense being one of the major spenders uh, because weapon systems and battleships and such cost a lot of money, uh, though at the same time you're buying aspirin and paper and pens and pencils. So the government is spread across all types of marketplaces, um, though most of the time they're in the sole purchaser just because there's a drone to be purchased or a satellite or putting a person on the moon or Mars, a space station, things like that that are very unique. And there's a system within the government to manage those contracts, negotiate those contracts, and audit those contracts.
So the players are obviously the federal government, but it's usually an agency. So Department of Defense, Department of Energy, CIA, uh, national parks. It can be anything on the government side, and they could be buying almost anything. Uh, the contractor, you'll see that word all the time in, in federal regulations and such that are related to procurement. They're supplying either goods or services. And then in the Department of Defense, they have a couple specialty agencies that focus solely on procurement. You have the Defense Contract Management Agency. Uh, they serve as the administrative part of contract management. So they often negotiate. They typically monitor contracts. Uh, they deal with change orders, uh, basically anything administrative. Whereas the buying group or the buying command, the, the general buying the tank or the admiral buying the battleship, uh, they tend to stay out of that work and let, let DCMA handle that. And then the Department of Defense has an independent audit agency, and it's called Defense Contract Audit Agency. Uh, by independent, it means it, it doesn't favor one service branch over the other, so it's not going to favor the Navy over the Air Force. Uh, prior to its formation, you had Air Force audit, Army audit, Navy audit, and uh, basically they were biased towards their own uh, issues and, and systems and regulations. Um, and to make it a more uniform playing field, under the Department of Defense, they created DCAA. Now, there's two types of contracting officers. Uh, the main one, often called the PCO, Primary Contracting Officer, procur Procuring Contracting Officer, is the person with all the power. They sign on the dotted line and, and buy that battleship or that jet fighter. Uh, below them, they'll have administrative contracting officers. They're all employed typically by DCMA and do the management of the contract, uh, carry out things, uh, do small revisions, task orders. They may have some limited negotiation power. Uh, they do negotiate, as we'll, when we get into audit, they negotiate the results of the audit. They'll negotiate rates and, and other small price adjustments. Um, there's a team of price analysts. They go in and determine how much should this radar cost. Uh, they're more financial oriented, looking to trends, looking to looking at estimates, and and for, more forward looking than uh, getting into details of actual costs incurred. Uh, because small business is very important to the federal government, there's a whole team specially formed just to make sure prime contractors are executing on their small business subcontract plans, that sub small business subcontractors are getting the education they need, uh, getting access to contracts and bidding, and, and so it's sort of a complete follow through from the Small Business Administration all the way up to the Department of Defense. And, and then was, there's a team of engineers. They're sort of the technical auditors. They'll audit uh, from an engineering and a technological point of view. You know, is, is the technology feasible is what the contractor proposing makes sense from a, a technical scientific basis. Uh, whereas the contract auditors, they're going to go in and see how the records are kept, are the systems and controls in place. Um, when it says something is $100, is it really $100 or is it not exist and it's fraudulent or something like that? Uh, is an estimate not very uh, based off of good judgment or good history, uh, many things like that that go into more than nitty gritty. And of course, it's a contract, so you have a, a team of attorneys to deal with anything that may come up during the life of the contract, uh, the negotiation in the beginning, all the way to the close and the end, and any contract dispute that may come up in the middle. Now, there's two types of contracts in the federal world. Uh, either it's a fixed price of some sort, or it's a reimbursable type contract where you get paid whatever costs you incur. Uh, there's many variations of these, and it typically has to do with the way the fee is paid. So you'll see a firm fixed with a fixed fee, with an incentive fee, um, so that it, it, it will change based on the technology or item being purchased. Now with a fixed price, uh, that gives all the incentive on the contractor side to come under and earn more profit, so to speak, and not overrun. Uh, it protects the government, and the government knows, I bought this fighter jet for $20 million, and it's only going to cost me $20 million. It's typically used in an area where you can predict the outcome because you've made so many. Maybe you're in lot four of the F-35, so you know, you know we've made 150 fighters already. We, we have a good idea what they're going to cost, so we can buy this lot on a fixed price. 
uh, or it could be we're buying a thousand tires from Goodyear. So it, it's kind of commercial off the shelf. It's easy to to price. Now, when you talk about auditing a fixed price, obviously, since uh, the price is fixed, we're going to pay a set amount if you're the government. And as a contractor, you know you're only getting so much. Uh, the audit is on the front end. It's to help the negotiators develop a price. And a lot of the audit has to do with the estimates being used to uh, support that fixed price that's being negotiated. And the billing can be any manner. Uh, typically, it's a progress payment, which the contractor will submit a bill each month for how many hours they've incurred or how much material uh, up to a set amount typically 85 percent and then they'll get the last 15 percent at delivery uh, for example uh, there could be a percent complete where there'll be a milestone when you get to x you get one third when you get to y you get two thirds and z upon completion uh, or it could be fixed unit if you're buying computer chips or boards uh, you're getting paid by the unit, so it might be for every thousand chips you deliver, you get a payment. And the important thing to notice is once the contract starts, the billings aren't going to equal the costs incurred because the co if it's an underrun, obviously the billings are being greater than the incurred cost, and if it's an overrun, it's the exact opposite. Now here are the typical audits that are related to a fixed price contract. We have the initial one, which is called a price proposal audit. Now, there can also be a rate proposal audit if the rates are going to be fixed. But it's a, typically an audit of all the estimates used to prepare the proposal. It, oftentimes, if it's a Department of Defense or a NASA audit, the DCA auditor will get advice from an engineer as to the amount of hours that are reasonable or the technology uh, feasibility or any improvement curves or such that are being used to develop the price. Now, the next audit we have is a defective pricing, is, is the colloquial way of speaking about it. It's basically an audit of the negotiation. And what that usually entails is the negotiation process goes all the way up to when they sign the agreement. Prior to that, the government is getting information from the contractor on the prices. So it could be vendor quotes. It could be subcontractor quotes. And to give an incentive to the contractor to provide the latest and greatest information, the threat of a defective pricing audit is, is there, and it's codified in, in what are known as the TINA regulations, which is truth in negotiations. And typically this audit is just to determine, was there any more recent information between the last time the government received some information, say two weeks before negotiations and negotiations? So if a quote came in for 50% less, the contractor didn't disclose it and you know, pocketed the difference, so to speak, uh, this audit would bring that to light and a price adjustment would be made. Um, oftentimes it's usually used on a contract that has a lot of material or subcontract where there's competing quotes and they often come in at the last minute right before negotiation. And then for all contracts, you may have a termination audit. For fixed price, it's mostly focusing on what's been done and how much profit's been earned and, and is that reasonable to get at a uh, negotiation point. Uh, it can be for all the costs that are reimbursable, so it really depends on the contract. But when it's terminated, there's typically a clause that relates to how to compute the costs of termination. And then the audit will be done to make sure that that complies with that clause. Next, we have cost type. So cost type can be just like fixed and based on a fee. You can have cost reimbursable plus an award fee, which is kind of like a signing bonus. Uh, you can get an incentive fee, which you know if you save costs or come up with a new technology, you get an additional fee. Uh, or it could be just a fixed fee, and just kind of a, a fixed amount of profit that you'll get at the end. Uh, but since it's cost, you're going to get reimbursed for all the costs that you spend on this contract. So as you can tell, there's, there's no incentive to control costs. It requires a lot more management, and that's where DCMA is involved. They're monitoring things like overhead. They're monitoring progress. Uh, they're monitoring on the labor side to make sure there's, you know, the labor is being focused appropriately or at the right mix. So there's a lot of external management done as well as audits that are done throughout the life of the contract. Here, unlike fixed, 
the billing is what the costs are. So it'll you will bill directly for your direct costs, for your direct labor, for direct materials. If it was $150, you would bill that amount and get a reimbursement for it. Now for your overhead, you'd estimate that over the year and use that rate, I mean, 10%, 20%, you know, just bill the overhead as you go. Then at the end of the year, you will submit an indirect rate proposal or an incurred cost claim, as they're often called, and sort of like a tax return where you get reimbursed for your actual indirect costs, and that will be subject to audit as well. And uh, DCA often does a lot of those audits. Uh, that's typically their main focus for most of the year. In addition, you need to have an accounting system that follows the government rules. And government accounting on the contract side has a large set of rules similar to a tax code that are designed mainly to prevent fraud and abuse or because you have situations where the contractor is the only person supplying this technology, this satellite uh, or space station or computer program. And so there is no incentive to uh, trim costs and compete in, in, a, in a competitive marketplace often. And so there's no outward external pressure to control overall costs for CEOs and managers and travel policies and such. And so your, the, the accounting system within the, defense, or the federal contractor is part of what shows the government that the controls are in place, that the costs are following the rules of the federal acquisition regulations, and all in all, it's, it's, you can certify your incurred cost data uh, complies as well. Now, there's many types of audits on a cost type contract. I've just got the four that are typical. Uh, before you get your contract, often you're subject to a pre-award accounting system survey. That is an audit where you go and look at the system of the contractor and make sure it, it can do everything it's supposed to do and comply with FAR. For example, it segregates on allowable costs. Uh, it distributes labor from the time card all the way through to the contract. It costs the contract in a way that it can be invoiced to follow either contract line item numbers or projects or task releases, however it's being invoiced. So there's a 14-part test uh, for that. Uh, once you get the contract, then you have an incurred cost audit every year, typically to get your indirect costs back. Uh, if there's a T&M commercial a contract, a time and material, there's also an audit related to that as well. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, there's a post-award accounting system audit, which typically focuses on how effective the internal controls, so how are they actually operating. Whereas with the pre-award, we look at it from a perspective, like does the system look like it could could control and operate effectively? And the post-award, we actually test it and determine that it did or not. And then once again, for a cost type, the termination typically is all incurred costs, but there's also costs to close down a program. You, you don't just shut off on day one of termination and say, I'm not incurring any more costs. There may be work that's in place. There may be mothballing that has to take a that has to go into place. So there's extra cost determination that will be on top of the amounts paid to date, and typically those are audited as well in a termination audit. Now the time and material is, is a, I would call a special contract for federal contracting, but often you've seen this if you've built something on your house uh, or had something repaired, it's time and materials often. Uh, the hourly rates are negotiated, so the only cost reimbursal part is how many hours. If it takes 100 hours, 1,000 hours, it's just times that rate. Oftentimes, there's a specific category or title. Uh, if you're doing a sending a scientist to the space station, you want that scientist. That person's name is there. It's that person's rate, everything is all negotiated, so it's just how many hours. Um, all the way down to if it's a big construction project, it's you know how many of this type of welder do I need? How many of this type of truck driver do I need? How many of this type of heavy uh, machinery operator do I need? So it's more flexible, and those the rate codes are more akin to the task rather than the experience. You typically see these when you just don't know how long it's going to take, but you know what type of labor and what kinds of labor and how much it costs. You just don't know how much 
And so the time and material works in that case as well. And the audit's fairly simple. All that we're doing is looking at quantities and the qualities of the cost. The rates are all fixed. We make sure the you know, negotiated rates are used. However, we want to audit the details of the hours to make sure they're true or the material uh, is supported with a quote and the quality. You know, if it calls for a 25-year nuclear engineer, we want to make sure that person has their 25 years and qualifies. And then one special audit, and it's fairly new. Uh, I guess it's quite time appropriate with the with the big hack going around. But uh, FAR puts a lot of security controls on your contract. So when you get a government contract, often you'll have clauses that require your computer systems to have basic security controls to hopefully prevent cyber attacks and such. And this requirement will flow down to subcontractors. So the prime, like a Boeing or a Northrop or a Lockheed may push this down to their subcontractors who supply a lot of parts underneath to make sure that they are in compliance with this. And it takes an IT audit to determine that you're in compliance. And just recently we have on the defense side, their FAR supplement established another requirement basically to report breaches. It also flows down to subcontractors. Um, and it basically has to be put in place this year, so in 2017, if, if you're subject to this, you need to make sure your systems comply with NIST 800-171, one of the many NIST 800 standards uh, for cyber and for information. But FAR covers systems and DFARS covers information. That's the distinction. Now we're getting into our next polling question. Which federal contracts require an audit? Cost type contracts, time and materials contracts, fixed price contracts, cost type contracts and T&M contracts only, or all of the above? So please check the box and scroll down if you can't see the submit button or click on the submit button. I'll give you time because uh, you need to get your three of four in for the CPE credit. One thing real quick, Robert, I was going to mention is that for anyone that's interested in more information about the NIST requirement in the handout section of today's presentation, there is a handout on that, and they can go ahead and download that at their discretion. Oh, great. Okay, I'll close the poll at this time. And it looks like uh, we've got a little, a few with the cost type in T&M, and pretty much everybody said all of the above, and which is the answer, all of the above. Any type of federal contract requires an audit at, at some time or the other, either in the beginning or in the end. Um, and by require, I mean it just possibly be audit. Uh, just like with the IRS, a lot of times the federal government doesn't audit every single contract. It would just, it's too much. So they, they go after the higher risk, and then there's also dollar thresholds. So now that we have a good understanding of kind of what's possible in the contract audit world, I want to go into some other government contracts. So this is going to be non-federal. So we have typical commercial contracts. It could be with vendors or service providers. It could be with a municipality, a jurisdiction of any type uh, has with their own vendors and service providers. Uh, and then other, say, contracts with other governments. The state might have a contract with the city. Uh, it could be over you know, the joint operation of a park. It could be sharing sheriff services or fire services. Um, there's many multi-jurisdictional contracts. And the type of contract and will affect when it should be audited or what type of audit. Uh, as we know, fixed price, you want to audit it before you negotiate. Cost type is as you as the life of the contract progresses, you audit it. Uh, time and materials, you're kind of towards the end. Um, service provider versus a vendor, you know, you're going to have delivery uh, of product maybe, but service provider you may or may not. It may just be an ongoing like IT or something. So if you have a contract and you want an audit, you need an audit clause. The federal contracts come that, that, that comes in the federal acquisition regulations. There's all sorts of clauses about the audits. Uh, other federal grants and such have, have clauses that provide for it just by virtue of regulation. 
but a commercial contract or maybe a contract with a city, county, or, or other jurisdiction may not automatically have a regulation that requires an audit, and so one would have to be drafted into the contract. Uh, and it's very important to have a good audit clause. If you have a clause that just says, we, we reserve the right to audit your books, it uh, doesn't really give the auditor a whole lot to work on. Uh, and I'll describe all the, the, the subjects of the audit and also the standards that impact that. But, but the subject of the audit is really, what are we going to audit? You know, where are we going to focus it? Uh, and standards are various sets of standards that say, you know, are we expressing opinion? Are we not expressing opinion? Um, are we doing a certain level of testing? Are we not doing any testing? Is, is this really just an agreement between the vendor and the and the, the the buyer and the seller? And they say they just want to test one thing, like the bank account or something like that. So, really, the audit clause should should try to match what what needs to be audited, what should be audited, uh, and, and what level it should be audited at. Now we can audit. Anything really in the contract? Uh, payments are the obvious one. Uh, you know, if progress payments are being made. We want to audit the records, books and records, to determine is, is that really the amount that should be invoiced. Uh, if there's a lockbox lock box arrangement involved, we may want to see cash flow and deposits to make sure all the monies or all the revenue was deposited. Uh, there could be a fee component of revenue, uh, like a management company fee say for property management, for um, anything where gross revenues are coming in and the vendor is getting 3% of sales or 5% of sales, and you're going to want to audit part of that to make sure the, the fee is correct. Uh, there also may be re, you know, revenue sharing. Uh, for every dollar that comes in, um, you, know, you as the management company get $0.75, cents and me as the owner of the asset get $0.25, cents. and you'll want to make sure that that's you know, accounted for correctly. On the expense side, you can have the same type of cost sharing and reimbursement provisions. You could have rate requirements. Uh, if you're, say, getting something built or something designed or you're hiring your auditor, you're going to want, you know, the associate should be at a certain rate, uh, the partner should be at a certain rate, the manager should be at a certain rate, you know, so you can, you can uh, vary that um, based on, on your needs and, and expertise. And then a lot of times maybe just compliance with contract terms. Maybe there's certain deliverables that are supposed to be done by certain times. Uh, maybe because it's sort of like a just-in-time inventory, uh, you need certain things done in, in, and want the ability to audit and determine that it's going to be done in time. Uh, there could be reporting requirements that need to be uh, delivered or dispersed uh, on your behalf uh, to, say, federal authorities or state authorities or just for your own internal use. So I'm quickly going to go through the relevant audit standards, sort of from, I want to say, least requirement to the most requirements. Uh, on top, we have the AICPA consulting standards. There's no opinion. Uh, it's not really for a third party use. It's essentially what it says. It's like a consulting engagement. The, the contract party and the auditor get together and decide this is what's going to be audited, this is what we want, and the engagement's carried out according to those terms. So it can be customized to whatever level you need, whatever, and, and, and thus uh, the prices can be more dependent on the actual work performed. Um, next we have the internal audit performance standards, uh, often called the Red Book standards. You can do these with opinion or no opinion. Uh, kind of the one difference between this and consulting standards is you do need to perform some sort of a risk assessment and, and audit plan, whereas with consulting standards, you could design it in a way where that would not be necessary. If there is going to be an opinion, it, it needs to really be lay down in detail what criteria, and, and it can be just custom to whatever the opinion needs to be given on. So it, it, there's a lot of work that needs to go in to, this, to determine what the opinion is going to be and what it covers and the criteria to say what the opinion is. Next, we have GAGIS performance audits. Uh, GAGIS often is called the yellow book. Uh, these standards are related to performance type audits. There is an opinion. Um, basically, you are providing findings or conclusions based on the sufficient appropriate evidence against some sort of criteria. 
And we'll contrast that with the next slide where we go into more of a Gagas full audit type opinion. Um, but here we're focusing on sufficient appropriate evidence, whereas in Redbook, you know, that you have the flexibility not to have sufficient appropriate evidence. Uh, obviously, with consulting standards, uh, you don't need that requirement as well. Uh, typically, these performance audits are used to assess the program's effectiveness. Uh, so if there's a, a certain amount of efficiencies that you want to see or economies, uh, you would want this type of audit done. Uh, it can also use, be used to test internal control compliance and effectiveness as well as compliance with regulations and laws. And it is one of the few audits that you can do on perspective an analysis or forward-looking type estimates. And then lastly, we have, I put this together, but GAGIS and AICPA have a test and assurance standard. So this is the highest level. Uh, the AICPA assurance standard is typically what you see with your financial statement audits. So when you buy a publicly traded stock and you get the annual report and you see the little account, the auditor's opinion. Um, GAGIS, we're using a yellow book. And GAGIS borrows from the AICPA assurance standards as well. So it's a combination of the two. There's three types of engagements that you could do. The examination, which is in the full-blown audit. Uh, here we're, we're, we're concerned with getting sufficient appropriate evidence to express the opinion, but it has to meet the criteria in all material respects and pre be presented fairly. So a little different than the performance where we were more concerned with sufficient appropriate evidence to meet the criteria. Here we're saying it also is in all material respects. Next, we have a review, a little less stringent. It requires sufficient testing to express a conclusion. So we're not getting, gaining evidence. We're, we're doing more test work, uh, not necessarily digging as deep. Um, we want to make sure that it's in conform, it conforms with the criteria and fairly stated in all material respects. Uh, you can't use this type of an opinion on an internal control or, or compliance with regulations because you're not doing any, you're not getting any evidence. You're only testing uh, at a higher level. And then we have agreed upon procedures, sort of the lower level of, of this higher opinion. Um, basically, it, it's similar to consulting standards in that you're agreeing to do certain procedures on certain subject matter. Uh, there's no opinion or conclusion. Uh, you're just basically reporting on the findings based on what procedures that you have uh, decided upon. And so some examples of a, a, an agreed upon procedure would be you know, due diligence in buying or selling a business, you know, really telling the auditor to focus on certain areas and, and report back. Uh, maybe you're verifying account balances, like a cash balance uh, or an accounts receivable balance. Uh, just that's so there's no real opinion. It's like okay, we'll look at this. What's the balance? It's X. Uh, and then if we're looking for policy or procedure compliance, sometimes an agreed upon procedure type engagement will work, uh, where we just say we'll define what compliance is in the agreement, and that'll be the procedure. And then you know, does it meet it or does it not meet it? So those are the standards that you can run across or have in your audit clause or consider when designing your audit clause. Now I'll talk about a few of all the different types of contracts. I'm going to start off here with a transportation projects. These can be at the local level, so it could be at a county level. Uh, generally they're you know, road building, bridge building, uh, often there are architectural and engineering work involved. So the DOT has set aud audit standards uh, because this is, this is sort of a hybrid. Even though you'll be, you'll be getting money from the Washington State DOT or the Florida DOT or California DOT or LA County or something like that, uh, the audit still has to be done according to the federal DOT requirements. Uh, and, and those require a, a very extensive audit. Uh, it's a yellow book of test standard. It goes into mainly testing the operating effectiveness of the internal controls of the construction or the engineering company. Um, it's a very extensive timekeeping system review, so akin to uh, to the review of, say, a T&M contract with a defense contractor. A lot of time card um, review. There's a minimum requirement, um, so it can't be risked away. Uh, and it's also it's a FAR audit. It's a federal acquisition regulation audit, similar to what you would get if you were contracting with the federal government. So even though you're you're getting DOT monies at a state level or a county level, you may be subject to an audit similar to a federal audit. 
One area that people don't think about is is uh, grants. Uh, a lot of cities, counties, uh, nonprofits have grants uh, where they get money either from a federal government or, or some other agency or foundation. Uh, they're often subject to an outside audit through the uniform guidance or the grant agreements audit requirements. Uh, those type of audits you may have heard are called a single audit. It is a Gagas Yellow Book audit, AICPA standards, uh, but only if you're expending over 750000 per fiscal year. And the focus of this audit is more on the, the financial statement of the recipient of the grant and the program expenditures at a high level. So we're only looking at each program at a very high one line item level. So how much money was spent on this program? Is that true or not? Uh, we're not getting into the nitty gritty of how the money was spent. Now optionally, these internal audits could be required. It could be through the grant agreement or it could be the grantee just wants to find out how more efficiently can I use these funds? Uh, do I have adequate controls in place to make sure I'm spending funds in the most efficient manner or in compliance with the grant agreement? Uh, and, and we can also get a total evaluation of the program's performance. So this could be brought on by the grantee themselves for their own benefit. It could be a requirement of the grantor uh, where they want to make sure that their money is being spent correctly uh, in conformance with the agreement. And then we have sort of a catch-all category. So this could be private, could be anybody. Uh, service provider contracts where private party or a jurisdiction is doing business with somebody. Um, you have uh, basically an audit of everything that we talked about before. It could be rates, revenue, deliverables based, payment based. Uh, typically there's no audit standards specified, but as I mentioned before, it's important to get an audit clause in there if you want the ability to audit and to also try to define what level uh, so there's no disagreement over how detailed the audit needs to be between the two parties. Uh, some good examples of, of these types of audits, uh, a lot of tribal enterprises, if it's property management, um, you maybe got a big retail concourse, you've got several different lease, leases out there, some are percentage of sales, uh, so maybe some are not. Uh, you want to make sure that the sales are correct uh, to make sure you're getting all the rent. Um, could be a parking services contract, a lot of municipalities contract out their parking permit and citation process. And those have several different fee structures, and you want to make sure that the fees are in the right buckets, um, as, as well as the expenses. There may be expenses that you're responsible for uh, reimbursing the uh, vendor, such as postage or uh, uh, collection fees or, or things like that. Uh, you want to make sure that the records are true, and, and an audit is one way to find that out. Uh, a lot of times at recreational facilities, like a golf course, you may have three different streams of revenue, one coming from greens fees, one from driving range, one from, say, golf school, uh, a cafe. Uh, they all may ha will have varying fees and expense structures, and the incentive, or not even an incentive, maybe the controls aren't good, and the money could be commingled in a way that you're not sure if the fees are really coming from the source they're, they're supposed to come from. Uh, and such, you could be overpaying or on the side of the management company, maybe they're underpaying, uh, but just an option that, uh, that a lot of things, you know, if you've got several fee types, several fee streams, uh, an audit's a good way to make sure that the controls are in place to keep them properly categorized so the fees are computed correctly and you're not spending too much. Now, IT support is a good example. They may have a certain cost for a desk visit, uh, for another cost for setting up a machine, another cost for repairing machines, another fee for you know, remote support. And then often uh, tax sharing agreements have clauses, to, you know, so many dollars go to the state, so many dollars go to the city or county, and you want to make sure you're in compliance. And if you have a vendor running that operation, are they doing so and not jeopardizing uh, your legal obligations? And the final poll, what are the benefits of performing audits on government contracts? Increase revenue realization, maximizes revenue, optimize expenditures, reduce reputational risks, or all of the above? And I'll give you a few seconds to make sure we get this in time. 
And just remember to hit the submit button. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> or scroll down if you don't see it. Okay. I will close the poll at this time. It looks like, yes, everybody, all of the above. So we did good on that question. Okay, I want to summarize some things here, key takeaways, uh, how to prepare for a required contract audit. Uh, if you're the one requiring the audit, it's a little easier. Uh, you just want to make sure your auditors are prepared, so give them as much information as possible so they can do a preliminary analysis. Uh, they're going to want to know what they're auditing, what what's the criteria, what standards, uh, and, and all of that's going to need to be set out in, in writing sometimes to make sure that everybody agrees to what depth. Uh, the audit will be done. If you're on the other side, the person being auditing, being audited, uh, the auditee, then to prepare for an audit, you really want to make sure uh, that you've been complying with the contract and have organized your data in a way that you can easily support that. Um, if you have it filed in a manner where you've got to spend a lot of time to to extract it to support your position, then uh, you you uh, you are wasting money and time that way. Uh, it takes many hours to support an audit ob often, and the best way could be organized to be organized. And the other is to make sure that the audit stays to the scope it says it's going to be. So you want to manage the auditor uh, in a way to you know, understand why they're requesting certain documentation uh, to ensure that it's related to what they're auditing and maybe not a phishing exercise by the other contract party. Um, so there's kind of obligations and duties on both sides. Um, let me turn it over to Mark uh, so he can address the final two summary points. Thanks, Robert. So, so if you're in the situation where you're not required to uh, either perform or audit or be audited, uh, then to be thinking about, so how can you use a contract audit to, to serve you? And, and I'll, I'll sort of address this in response to one of the questions that was re submitted of sort of relative to performance. So. So think of um, you run an organization and you want to help your organization to operate better in whatever way possible, efficiency, economy, effectiveness, and you might do a performance audit of a department, a function, a program. Well, think of your contract uh, or a contract audit as the same vehicle to do that but on a third party and someone providing service for you, someone outside of your organization. Um, as Robert mentioned, it could be between two cities, a city and a county. It could be between a tribal government and its enterprises. Um, it can be between uh, a government and a not-for-profit is providing services. Golf is a, is a great example of that. Um, ambulance services, benefit services, uh, all sorts of things where don't, don't think of it just as sort of in this, uh, and hopefully we've, we've sort of helped to view it this way, is not sort of in a cloister of, of a contract or in a vacuum of a contract, but this is a way for us to assess how is this working for us? How is this relationship working for us? And, um, and, and use it to as an ability to enhance your, your overall ability to get what you're trying to get accomplished, accomplished you know, through that contract. And so then, so then how do you prepare for that? So one is if you don't have the, the right to audit in your contract language, something to work with your legal department to get that language introduced. Um, and then things that you can do sort of on your own are, so inventory what contracts you have for services, for products and services. Uh, very often our clients, uh, and, and I mean very, very often, our client organizations don't have an inventory handy of what they have in place across their organization. And that takes us back in, in part to decentralized activities, but, but what do we have in place? What are we, out, quote unquote, outsourcing to other parties? Then assess the risks associated. What's the dollar value associated with those? What's our level of um, interface or oversight of those? Are we, are we monitoring them closely? Do we get reporting? Uh, or are things just sort of happening and, you know, if there's not an issue, then, then kind of it, it's all good. And then, and then, so then inventory, assess risks, 
and they come up with a systematic program of just we're, we're going to make our way through these contracts over time. And again, think of them very similar to doing a performance audits within your organizations, respectively, that these are just now touching the external uh, resources that are also performing on your behalf. And so the contract audits really can be part of a holistic internal audit program that can be part of a holistic approach to how do we help our organization perform better, better achieve our goals and our objectives, our mission and vision, and do that in the most efficient and effective and economical way possible. And, and so these, these really, if, you, if you're on the uh, contracting side, these really can, can serve you. And so with that, I think we'll turn it back over to Tanya with any questions that have been submitted. Um, or if you haven't submitted one and, and have one, please feel free to, to do that now. Thank you so much, Mark and Robert, for a very insightful presentation today. Um, businesses today need as much leverage and information as possible. So as Mark said, if you find you have questions um, or say questions following the close of our broad broadcast, please contact um, Mark or Robert directly. They're happy to talk with you. Uh, in the interest of time uh, and respecting your commitment to us today, um, if you've submitted a question and we haven't gotten to it, we will answer it outside of the, the presentation. So we would ask you now to help us to help you by um, completing a brief survey. And we hope that you have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.